So welcome to this short video in which we'll be taking a quick look at the uh, the day of in the life of a stack tester, one of those hardy individuals who goes out into sometimes um, quite unpleasant situations to check that um, that businesses and processes are um, protecting the environment. And so to help me with that today, I'm delighted to say that I have with me Paul Adamczyk, who's Managing Director of Alkali Environmental. Um, Paul has a, a bachelor's and a master's degree at the University of Leeds. Uh, he um, left university, became a stack tester himself. Uh, he then spent almost six years with the Environment Agency, uh, working as an environmental committing officer. And then after a brief period as uh, an environmental consultant, he set up Alkali Environmental. And Paul's going to walk us through the day of a stack tester, but I wonder if Paul, first of all, welcome, by the way, um, if Hello. you could uh, very briefly describe um, what Alkali Environmental does. Yes, uh, Alkali, obviously I set up Alkali um, myself about five years ago, and we're predominantly a stack commissions uh, testing contractor. So we're uh, accredited under UCAS um, and them certs for providing stack commissions testing um, results and testing. Uh, we also do uh, air quality, um, environmental consultancy and ambient monitoring as well so we can provide a you know a broad service to to industry okay so uh, when you're planning uh, a, a site visit I, I assume there's some work that has to be done ahead of the day itself yes it's um it's quite prescriptive really on what we need to what information we need in order to um provide a quotation for the works and to sign a, sign a contract which very much details what we're going to do Mm. And then there's um, a site review and then um, documentation that needs to go in advance and be agreed by the client. So very much um, in, in the in the start of um, uh, negotiation with a, with a client, it's very much, you know, what's required, what's the purpose of it? Um, is, it for, if it, is it for compliance work? Is it for process investigation? Is it optimization work? And then very much to, to understand what the requirements of the testing are, really what, what species are required for testing, um, how that's going to be delivered, because some, in some um, scenarios there's a, a number of different uh, ways of, 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 of getting results, some, a number of different methods to test the same compound, and we need to know what the most appropriate one is uh, in order to you know, provide the best value to the client. Um, then it's very much, once we've established what we're going to test, it's very much how we're going to test it. So that comes down to a, generally a review of the site. So we would often go to site, um, visit the sampling locations themselves and really see what facilities are there. And because of the nature of our work, there's there's a lot of um, a lot of requirements that needed to be put in place. And a lot of these are legal requirements for sites to do uh, you know, about having the right platforms, the right ports, the right access in order for us to do the, you know, the, the job correctly. So it's about finding out where, you know, if there's, if there's any gaps in that, what needs to be done in advance of the visit, and also then that then translates, once that work's been done, translates into something called an SSP, which is really a plan. Uh, and that's the agreement between um, ourselves, a test house and the client to say, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. And then the client has to review that and 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 provide confirmation that that's, that's what needs to be done. So that's what he wants to do done in, a, in advance of going to site. So there's quite a lot there to do. And, you know, obviously repeat works quite easy. And if there's previous work been done, then obviously there's a lot of that information been done before. But if it's a new site or a new, you know, new development or a lot's changed on our site, you really need to get on site and understand exactly what these nuances are. You know, and some of them, um, most clients and sites are really not experts in, in in exactly what's needed. So a lot of times, you know, our advice and guidance is is essential in order to get those things done. And, and that helps the team when they get to site later on. So they don't get any, you know, any um, unforeseen problems that may that may uh, come about. Sure. So um, uh, presumably the equipment that you need to take to site in terms of the analyzers and so on, uh, dictated by the measurement species uh, that you're targeting. But what are the workhorses from an instrumentation point of view? It's um, it, it, it's quite prescriptive what we can take. You know, in, in order to do uh, UCAS and MSA accredited testing. Um, there's a, you need to have, you know, one of the pillars of MSERTs is to have the accredited analyzers. And um, so there is a, you know, there's a list and a set of certificates that each analyzer must have in order for, you know, for 
companies like us to be able to use them in the field to provide accredited results. So that's the, the big the big key. And the real workhorses are you know, manufactured, um, the obviously multi gas analyzers. The the classic one is the Hariba 250 and 350, um, which are multi gas analyzers. There's a number of FID of analyzers available. Um, um, I want to mention them all. Uh, not so famous, isn't you know, a number are available. Uh, and of and of course, there's also FTR analyzers, um, which are generally the the um, the online online analyzers we use commonly in the field. And in addition to that, there's a, a number of manual sampling trains, which are um, enable you know enables you to do isokinetic and non-isokinetic testing, um, which is generally particulate matter and wet chemistry. Mm. And that's using you know generally there's clean air manufacture uh, a range apex instruments in the US and Millennium manufacture manual ones and there's also other manufacturers like Dado Labs and um, mm. uh, Takora who also do isokinetic ones alongside SICK who manufacture a, an automatic isokinetic and a number of other manufacturers as well um, mm. that can be used. And, and typically, what are the main challenges that your teams experience on site? The biggest challenge is um, there's a there's a very um, prescriptive document um, that's got had various guides over the last twenty five years, um, which tells says exactly how how the, how the testing location should be done in terms of the size of the platform, the depth of it, um, the provision of of power, um, port size, and so on and so forth, and that's really quite straightforward to comply with if you're building a new plant if you've got an existing plant which most of the sites in the uk are of that you know approaching that age it's difficult to then retrofit um a plant to, to meet every every part of those you know caveats and and, 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 um, and conditions so that makes it quite difficult sometimes uh, to find the correct location and Oftentimes, in order to comply with those requirements, there's a, there's a heavy um, capital expenditure that's required. So that mm. can often create compromises that, that have to be made on site. That, that's the reality. Um, sometimes is that is that sometimes compromises have to be made, and it's it's fair and reasonable to do so. Um, generally, the obviously the issues with us are site production uptime. Um, oftentimes, you know, British industry and, and industry as a whole. Doesn't run twenty four seven all the time, and oftentimes you'll you'll get to site set up and the plant will break down. Mm. Um, so that's that's a classic one. Um, there's also obviously weather. You know, we can't work in heavy rain. We can't work in if there's if there's in sub zero temperatures or if there's snow or ice on a platform or a work area. Naturally, we, it's, that's just not safe for us to work in. And obviously, because a lot of our work is is work at height. You know, we've we've always got one eye on the weather, and we always check the weather. You know, the day before and the morning of the of testing. Because obviously, if you're working at high on a platform, you know, high winds or potentially incoming storms um, could be could give you very short notice to clear the platform and leave. So mm. that's something we need to be mindful of. And obviously, that's done as part of our our safety assessments and risk assessments before the the job starts and ongoing as the jobs as the jobs being progressed. Yeah, and and you you've been um, stack testing for a few years now. Has the um, technology changed much over the years? Um, I would like to say yes, but the answer is really no. Um, <laughs> you know, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a few more more advanced analyzers come out, but really the the fundamental way we do uh, emissions testing has not changed in probably before since before I I I, um, I started you know in the industry twenty years ago. You know, the, the fundamentals haven't haven't changed. Um, mm -hmm. You know, a, a few LODs are a bit lower than they are now. You know, it's, um, but but fundamentally, the standards um, are the same principles as, as as was done in in the early two thousands. Um, but like I say, the 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 analysis side has changed a little bit. You know, the the, the LODs and sensitivity of uh, lab analysis has, has got better um, over the over the last twenty years. But yeah, really, a lot of our equipment and work has not. There's not been a revolutionary change in the last twenty years. Um, it's very, very similar to what it was um, a number of years ago. There's been some iterative improvements. You know, obviously there's a new, a new um, ELVs are brought in. Obviously, there's there's a, there's a new um, new set of ELEs with the, with the um, the ways of no, new ways incineration breath. So that's that's tightened up some emission value values, which then the analyzer manufacturers have to 
tighten up their um, certified ranges to be able to achieve accuracy at those lower levels. Mm. That's required a, a, a an improvement, but it is iterative improvement rather than a, um, a fundamental rethinking of how we deliver emissions monitoring. Yeah. Uh, so it's 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 been yeah iterative improvement over the last twenty years rather than a revolutionary how we change things. Yeah. A lot of the work we do now, a lot of the emission, you know, a lot of the tests we put are pushing the the limits of what is achievable by the methods we use. But really, a lot of the, a lot of the tests now, uh, a lot of the results that we have provided are, are probably getting the, to the limits of what is achievable with the current technologies. Right. So I suppose the, the big the big thing is that no, it's not really changed in the last twenty years. It's mm. been iterative improvement rather than revolution. But we're now getting into the cusp of what. The next generation of thing of testing is will need a um, a revolution in how in how the the um, the work is done. So that's probably quite a point and pertinent point to put in. So I'll probably um, it's the same we can't scroll back and look at a place to, to splice it in. But we'll um, okay. yeah we'll do does, that. So does does that mean that the um, environmental regulations have become more stringent over the years? Yes, definitely. Right. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay, that, that's fascinating. Thanks very much for your time uh, today, Paul. That's been great. Yeah, thanks a lot, Graham. 